it's time for To The Last Drop Podcast with Liam Delcom and Brandon Nell. Welcome back. It's To The Last Drop. I'm Brandon Nell and with me as always is... Liam Delcom. Ah, you are. Well done, Liam. All the way back from Hong Kong, you spent a couple of days, whirlwind days, um, and you, I was hoping you were going to get see a lot more Sevens rugby, but... Apparently, you didn't see that much Sevens rugby. You were doing the other delights of Hong Kong. Well, yes and no. Um, we only got to see the the final day, the finals day. And by then, it was clear the, the Blitz box weren't going to be uh, contesting the cup. Um, they were already knocked out. So uh, that put a bit of a dampener on it. But we got to see the bulk of the, uh, the Sunday action. And um, I have to say, I mean, nothing has changed. I haven't been to the Hong Kong Sevens for good, uh, almost thirty years. Jeez. And in many, in many ways, um, you know, nothing has changed in that sense because it is still the biggest um, rugby party there is. Um, yeah, people just commit themselves to having a good time. Um, and um, yeah, as I say, uh, you know. It's, it was a pity we only caught the final day, but it was good. You know, whistle stop mm-hmm. tour, but it was fantastic. I take it the South Stand is still the South Stand there, the big party stand? You know what? For a while, I lost my bearings a little bit because I hadn't been there for a while. And um, when I turned to the South Stand, I was like, okay, but it's busy. And then the stand right in front of me was also very active. And for like probably a good 15, 20 seconds, I had to get my bearings like, okay, because everybody was having a good time. You couldn't sort of discern north from south after a while. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I take it, I don't know, I'll ask you, if you did you make it to Lang Kwai Fong afterwards, the uh, infamous street? No, uh, no, no, no. Cathay Pacific would put the whole thing together for us. Uh, they had a fairly tight program, so uh, your own time was very, very limited. For those who don't know, and, and, and Liam will probably remember from his last time there, uh, Lang Pai Fong's a street with all the bars where um, a tour guide once told me people go crazy. But uh, what it is, it's a very, very steep slope downhill, and they give you these jetty tequilas at every bar. So by the time you reach the bottom, you can speak fluent Chinese. So um, it's, it's quite a place to go. It's quite an experience to go down that road. So if you're ever in Hong Kong, Please do that. That's worth the tra- worth the effort, definitely. But I suppose we should turn our attention to a bit more uh, Investec Champions Cup. Um, it's a yes. couple of, only one one South African team left in the Champions Cup, and it's been quite a week for Jake White. Um, we were there earlier this week, and he was talking about the eight different flights. And I know a lot of people have sort of SA Rugby released a statement saying it wasn't eight different flights. Uh, but I mean, I was there on on Tuesday morning, and I saw the flight list, so I, I can I can confirm it definitely was eight different flights. Obviously, SA Rugby pulled out a couple of stops, got them better flights a bit later, and so everybody sort of wins in that that situation. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I, it might be a bit of a storm in a teacup, but it definitely shows highlights um, some of the challenges. Let's let's not say problems, challenges that South African teams have in this thing. And it's easy for our, if anybody from Europe is listening. Uh, it's easy to say, yeah, but why are the South Africans playing? And we are in the, the, the tournament at the moment. We're buying into the tournament uh, at, at a significant cost to SA Rugby. And somehow these these sort of problems need to be sorted out in the long run. Yeah, I, I, I noticed uh, overnight one of your favorite UK journalists, Brendan, uh, also tweeted, uh, wrote a tweet, uh, suggesting that this is the result of having, the, you know, the, the almost idiocy of having South Africa in these tournaments. Uh, it, look, it is hugely undesirable to uh, to be traveling this way. Uh, but I suppose that is the product of, um, you know, having the knockout games and there's only a week turnaround time. Uh, from one game to the next. But it is quite clear uh, there will have to be uh, a solution left to be sought uh, or found for for, um, for this problem because it, it clearly stacks the odds mm-hmm. so much against you uh, to win at the business end of the tournament. Yeah, I was, I was listening. You talk about uh, my favorite journalist. I'm t- I take, it, take it's the one that blocked me after Bongi's... Uh, Correct. Uh, Bongi's thing in the World Cup, he was very upset that I suggested that somebody may have misinterpreted Bongi at that stage. Uh, but uh, this about him, I, I listened actually to their podcast yesterday, and um, the one interesting fact that came out is that um, how stacked in, in, in these this competition anyway, the home sides have it. 
because mm. apparently in, in the, the last 10 years or something, the only side to have won away from home in a, in a playoff game is La Rochelle. La Rochelle. Yeah. yeah, and they did it last year, then in the final, and obviously this weekend in a heartbreaking loss for the Stormers. Uh, but that's that just shows you the quality. And the only way we're going to compete, and that brings back to probably one of Jake's points, which he's got the right one, um, is that if you have strong squads, if you have South Africans playing uh, in South Africa, uh, it's a tough one because it's at odds with the Springbok um, selection policy, which is obviously pick everybody from everywhere. But from a, from Jake's personal point of view, and obviously he's worried about his own team, and you can understand that, mm. um, he'd want to have a, a stronger squad where he could have two sort of equally uh, matched squads and he can, you, can, you can use them. That's what you're going to need if you're going to yeah. do well in the European Cup, especially in this time when you're going to go up against some of the giants like uh, Toulouse, mm. Leinster, La Rochelle, and um, I suppose the dark horses this year, uh, Bordeaux. Yeah, they, yeah, you could probably chuck in Northampton there as well, but I don't see them going the distance. Look, if if you're a South African franchise, the, I think the only way in the current climate you're going to be able to challenge for the Champions Cup is if you prioritize it that way, in the way you assemble your, your match day 23s from one week to the next. You'd almost have to say you're writing off the URC, but of course you can't do that. You can't say that. Um, it's not as if the... The Champions Cup is a week in, week out slog. Uh, you know, from uh, you know, from one end of the season to the next, it's not. You can actually prioritize some of the games, but as as things stand, there is there is almost no way they can win it because you would have to have an in, an inordinate amount of luck along the way, especially in the knockout games. Uh, some of them will have to be away from home to go on and win this, uh, this competition. So, um, yeah, I think a couple of things will have to change. And, you know, stronger squads is one way of getting there. But there again, that's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. I, th- I think the other thing is as well is to realise is that um, you, in knockout games in any competition, you have a home ground advantage. You have referees who often give uh, the 50-50s to the home sides. Um, and you have the crowds that play obviously a huge part in those so the decisions, and that's just in the normal game. Uh, now you add yeah. the, fa- the travel factor in, and in the Bulls' case, I mean, they were Dragons and Leinster, and they came back to play Lyon. Now they're back on a flight, and then they're going to come back and play Munster. Um, and that's quite a tough one. So, um, yeah, listen mm. to Jake. I mean, it's a lot been talk- talked about the flights that he's, they've got to Northampton. But, yeah, it's interesting that uh, yeah, they also got to have one eye on next week because they play Munster next week, defending URC champions in a huge game, especially if they want a home playoff. They're going to have, need to win that game. So listen to what Jake said when uh, asked him about that. What I have taken out, Brendan, is that Northampton are a very good team. I mean, they're number one, they're number one in the premiership. Uh, they play incredible brand of rugby. And if you look at their stats, it's not just they're only good at certain things. I mean, what I meant by that is their line-out strong, their defensive sets are very good, their attack is is strong, their points scored are strong. Um, so it's not like there's one area where, you know, as I said, they just play attacking rugby or whatever. You know, they they really balanced, well coached. Um, and they, and they, there's a reason why they're number one. I mean, you talk about it, they've 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 beaten Saracens, you know, they've beaten Bath, they've I think they've lost to Bristol twice, which which again can happen. But I think they've only lost four times this year. So I mean, they're they're a really good team. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, it, it was yeah. I mean, I think that's why I think that makes that one try they scored from their own half as well. I mean, they they're not just a team that that sort of only do one thing. I mean, they're also quite balanced in terms of playing with their forwards and their backs. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it's another challenge we have and it's away and it's, you know, it's eight o'clock at night and it's, you know, and it's in a stadium that we all know is a, you know, is a, is a nice stadium to play in. Um, so it gives me an opportunity to, to sort of grow as a group. I think that's what I keep, you know, I keep thinking to myself is, I mean, there's John Dobson said it and he's right, you know. It's funny, John Dobson said that now, when I said that three years ago, you guys were looking at me like I was crazy, you know. I said to you, they're still going to take a while. Just getting back to uh, the situation with, you know, how you keep your squad fresh um, when you travel. I suppose one way of getting around that is if you have charter flights, but that takes us into a different stratosphere cost-wise. Yeah. Uh, as well. But it may have to be something in the short term, certainly, that uh, some teams will have to consider. 
I yeah. think, think about it carefully. Some some of the franchises, um, the owners of them have, have deep pockets. They they do, but I mean, look, I I I, I don't have the, enough knowledge of the, the the airline industry or you know that sort of thing to know how much a charter costs for forty people. Um, but I can think it's quite significant anyway. And I suppose there are agreements in the tournament that tell you. Um, mm. Why yeah. you can do that? I know the Bulls have um, asked uh, the European Cup and SA Rugby if they can make their own travel arrangements in future, but that apparently the, the answer I got when I, sp- I spoke to them about that was that it can only really happen when they, um, yeah, when we fully join the European EPCR mm. in what a year and a half, two years time. And of course, you know, the, the other thing is as well that the Bulls face Northampton now. Now they they. Um, if they happen to win that that game, uh, the semifinals and the finals have to be played in Europe according to the current structure, yeah. <laughs> which means they'll have to play at Ashton Gate if if they get a home. And the only way they get a home one is if La Rochelle beat Leinster. And if La Rochelle beat Leinster, facing La Rochelle anyway is quite a task. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's almost like you don't win. doesn't matter what happens. Yeah. Uh, or your, your other thing is to go to probably Aviva Stadium, in front of fifty thousand people to face Leinster in a, in a semi final, which you know is is just as huge. So um, and I mean, yeah. and the other side to lose weights and and you know probably probably Bordeaux or uh, I'm not sure if Exeter or Harlequins can really get through there. Uh, Favorite no. French teams there, but uh, yeah, it's a tough task. To, to be fair, um, I, I suppose La Rochelle going to Loftus compared to La Rochelle going to Cape Town. I think the Lofters one probably is a more difficult mm. proposition for them. Uh, obviously, they haven't played there before. There's altitude. Um, and, of course, Cape Town is a lot similar to what they experienced back home. Um, but, yeah, that, that's in the future. And that's we, we don't know if that's going to come to pass because, of course, as uh, uh, Stade Rochelet, they still need to get past Leicester. Yes, and that's uh, that's shaping up as probably the biggest game of the weekend. I mean, mm. I know we're concentrating on the South African teams, but that is the huge, huge game of the weekend, uh, the repeat of last season's final. I think Lens are probably favourites, given that they beat them in the pool round in uh, La Rochelle. Uh, but uh, yeah, this La Rochelle team, you just saw on Saturday against the Stormers when the, those big players started thundering mm. up the field, they're very hard to stop. So that's going to be a very interesting game to watch. How much difference was Jacques and- Nava Mark? Mike, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, team, he might. Uh, look, I mean, that was an epic final last year. It was just close combat and it was brutal. Um, and it would be interesting uh, ahead of this match to get the perspective of somebody like Jakub Paper who saw it, um, you know, yeah, first, hand, uh, yeah. first hand and from, from close quarters. Yeah, no, I, I must admit that's uh, it's it's a huge game of the weekend. Uh, uh, just I mean, but just lastly, I just let's close off on the Bulls uh, on on the Champions Cup facing Northampton Saints. Northampton Saints, sorry. Uh, if you anybody watched Sunday's game against Munster, uh, and we all know how good Munster are, that performance, especially in that second half. Uh, where they totally dominated Munster was quite impressive, and they certainly a team that can play from anywhere. And uh, yeah, and and then when Jake's, uh, yeah, Jake's probably taking a team that's a, quite a bit changed because there are some niggles and 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 bumps and bruises. So you're going to probably see a couple of different players playing this weekend. But this is what he said on how good they are. Still, are we playing the champions of URC next week? You know, that's what people forget. You know, and now it doesn't matter whether people go, yeah, but it's at Loftus and all that. They are the champions of URC. They came away from home and beat Stormers, who were the current holders last year, as we all know. They're out of the European Cup. They got two weeks to prepare. I mean, they're going to be they're going to be as prepared as they can for two weeks to play the Bulls in a in a game that we need to win and they need to win if we're going to stay uh, alive in hosting playoff games in in at Loftus. Well, look, I think we ch- I try and challenge them every week on performance. Full stop. You know, I think one of the things I said to you after the game this weekend was the reaction we had after getting you know the result we did against Leinster. Uh, and the re- reaction was to play like we did at home against Leon is exactly what you want to see. You know, you don't want to see a team that if they if they have a, a bit of a you know bad outing that that rubs off on the next fixture. So it's not just about playing away; it's about these pressure games anywhere being good enough to to have a performance that that gives you a chance to win the game. And last weekend was it as close as perfect performance? Yeah, not really. I mean, to be fair. 
I mean, we, yeah, I mean, they are, they were things we did really well. I think the way we, the way I like the way we interchange forwards and backs. I like the way we varied the way we played. Um, and I like the fact that we, we almost felt what it was like when Leinster had us in the same situation and we could replicate that, you know. So from a, from a performance point of view, and as you say, perfect performance, it was perfect in that we could sense that we, we took a lot of learning out of what happened to us against a Leinster team that can really, you know, attack well. So let's turn to the other competition where there's a South African uh, 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 representative. The Hollywood Bet Sharks have turned the corner. I think we can safely say that now. Three games in a row they've won. Um, things are looking better in Durban for them. They play Edinburgh, a team they beat two weeks ago quite comfortably um, in in uh, that that uh, that game. And uh, there's six of the eight quarterfinals are URC teams. So I'm not sure what that says about the URC. Uh, there's definitely a debate over there about representation in these competitions that could be had. But, uh, yeah, we all hoping for the Hollywood Bets Sharks because if they get that, if they win that competition, and it's still a way away, um, yeah, they get automatic qualification to the Champions Cup. So, uh, yeah, John Plumtree got a big task. He's got all these big guns, and uh, Edinburgh are going to be tough this weekend. You'd have to say that they will be tough. I mean, especially if you look back to what happened uh Two weeks ago, but uh, uh, you know the sharks now have a little bit of momentum, so uh, that should count for something. And it's quite clear that this competition is their way out, if you know what I mean. It's their way to sort of turn around their season, get something tangible. Uh, there is no doubt, and the owner, uh, the well, the main owner, as well as the CEO, has, has expressed this in the past. I mean, there's no doubt that getting into the Champions Cup and making a statement there and potentially winning it further down the line is something that is very much on the agenda. So, um, you know, it's, they, they have to win this competition to at least get a foot in the door. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and, yeah, we spoke this week uh, a bit to Bongi and Benambi, um about the clash uh, and, and just about how difficult it often is with sides playing the same side they played you know, in the recent past mm. and how those teams adapt, even if they were well beaten and, and it makes it a much more difficult fixture. But yeah, ha- have a listen to what Bongi's thoughts on the game. Yeah, I think the fact that it's a quarterfinal and a whole different uh, uh, another competition uh, makes it even more difficult. Uh, we know that they, they're definitely going to come here uh, even better prepped than before. Uh, I, I think they're going to play a, a, a better team. We, we, we noticed last time they're missing a couple of um, a couple of the key players, and obviously they just came back from uh, playing Six Nations. I think they're going to be definitely fresh and more and more um, and more challenging this time around. Uh, especially with a coach like uh, uh, Sean Avery that they have, he knows how to prepare a team to come play down here in Durban and playing an important uh, a game like a quarterfinal. They're definitely going to come back uh, stronger. Uh, probably uh, more at stake than there was uh, with previous games uh, that we played. Um, we definitely want to want to make sure that we make this uh, competition that we are in uh, very successful. We know it's not going to be easy, especially playing Edinburgh, who have already played us before, and it was a tough game playing them in the URC. And I think this time it's going to even be more, um, uh, much more of a challenge to us. So it's all up to us how we prepare, how we make sure that uh, it's obviously a short week turnaround. We play it on Sunday and have to prepare again for a Saturday early afternoon um, match. So yeah, uh, there's a lot of pressure, but I think if we keep things simple. Uh, we make sure that everyone buys into the plan uh, with the kind of players that we have and the coaches that we have. Yeah, we just need to go out there and deliver. Yeah, 100%. Uh, playing the same position again uh, uh, does make it challenging. It does does make it quite difficult because obviously um, they know that in a short turnaround, you're not going to change much to your game plan. Uh, so yeah, I think they'll be better prepared uh, for the weather and everything else. Uh, but yeah, uh, looking at us, looking at, uh, looking at our team, we just need to make sure that uh, we know our roles, you know, uh, we believe in our system, we believe in our plan. And obviously playing uh, playing at home also gives us a sort of a bit of advantage, uh, knowing that the Sharks fans will definitely come out for this weekend. Uh, we're looking forward to having them here. Uh, they've always been uh, they've always been on our side, especially with the, with the, with the difficult start that we had. You know, um, some of them uh, never gave up supporting us, which we appreciate a lot. So, yeah, we're looking forward to having the home, uh, the home ground advantage and uh, having our fans out here. But, uh, yeah, we're definitely looking forward to the game. So a huge weekend of action there uh, in, in Europe. Uh, we all be watching, obviously, hoping for the two South African teams to win. Uh, the Sharks, I think, have probably got a better bet because they're at home. The Bulls will be very interesting to watch at 9 o'clock at night, South African time. 
Um, but then also off the field, there were some developments this weekend. Uh, the Stormers obviously have concluded their equity deal with Red Deezer Investments. Um, the the LaRue family part of that. And uh, the new CEO, Johan LaRue, um, who is handling the business uh, for, for the LaRue family and the Irish Arda uh, group that also is part of that consortium. Uh, yeah, they ha- they came together and chatted to us, some of the journalists uh, about their plans for the st- future of the Stormers, who I think have done incredibly well given the off-field challenges. And I've reported, and you've probably reported on it a lot over the last couple of years, all the um, missteps, shall we say, let's be polite and say mm. missteps. Uh, that, it's, that in, in fact, it's, it's had to be a feature of South African, successful South African rugby teams, and I suppose other codes as well over the last 20-odd uh, years, almost 30 years. It's the ability of the people in charge, and often the coach, to ring-fence your team to sort of yeah. insulate it from the troubles elsewhere in the sport, and and that may afflict even your your own franchise or team. Um, and again, I mean, this was another classic example in Cape Town of how a coach like John Dobson was able to do that. And I think the owners are very much on the same page. They would want that culture that has um, sprouted from that to try and maintain that as far as possible. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, look, I mean, we all we all know that Cape Town's an easy place to sell to a rugby player if you're going to go recruit players. It's a beautiful city and it's a lovely, and it can become a powerhouse. They've got a stunning stadium there in Greenpoint. Um, and yeah, if they get it right financially, and they've got quite a hill to climb there, they've got to pay off some loans, they've got to sort out the Newland Stadium. Um, yeah, there's a, there's quite a bit of finances to sort out. But if they can do that, uh, yeah, there's nothing stopping the Stormers. The amount of talent in the, in Cape Town uh, and, and the surrounds, mm. uh, although Willant would probably argue some of that is probably their talent, but the amount of mm. talent around in that just there is is amazing. Yeah, the conveyor belt is strong, there's no doubt. Uh, and, and we probably need to make the point, it's not as if they can keep everybody. I mean, if, even if you had the money, uh, it's impossible to keep everybody. So you're, uh, the way you select, the way you, uh, I suppose, identify talent and put them on your, you know, basically make sure that they're on your conveyor belt mm. from an early age, uh, that is going to be, talent identification is going to be very key. Well, I mean, John Dobson, quite ironically, in this same sort of press conference, uh, made the point that the uh, I think it was other. I'm not. I think it was Paul Boys. The, the last three years, Paul Boys uh, number eight are, were Frankie mm. Horn, Evan Ruiz, and Cameron Honnickle. And yeah, and not possible. all of them will stay in Cape Town, obviously. If yeah. you know, if they all vying for the same spot. And all three of those will probably be. Springboks within the next year, probably you'd say. Um, so, so yeah, it's quite difficult to to keep all those in one province. So, you can understand that problem that they have, and you're gonna. There's always gonna you're gonna lose a guy here and there. That's what happens to all provinces. So, you got to be very clever in, in how you recruit and how you sort of put that jigsaw together of your team, you know, the mm. and experience and things like that. So. Yeah, uh, it's going to be interesting to see this, but have a listen to to Johan Leroux. Uh, Liam, you had a chat to him last week as well, so you you also had a, had a, ch- a chat to him. But listen, this is how he explained um, to all the journalists present uh, how the future of the Stormers would work. I'm going to talk more about the future and the role of CEO and how we see the club, the future for the club, and, and less about the transaction. I think that's been covered quite a bit. Um, and I think this, this uh, press conference about... My appointment as a CEO and the vision I have for the club, and we're gonna, we'll, we can discuss the transaction if there are other questions at a, at a different stage, not, not in my prepared remarks. Um, I've read so many articles by, written by you in the room over the years, it feels like I know you. You guys know nothing about me, so I thought it's a nice opportunity just to tell you a bit about myself. Um, my name is Johan Leroux, um, originally from Stellenbosch, live in Cape Town now, live here and work here with my wife and four children. I studied in Stellenbosch before moving to Johannesburg to go work in banking. Um, 2007, I returned to Cape Town, got married. I bought a house less than five minutes walk from here, firm in the belief that Western Province was going to move from Newlands to, to this stadium after the World Cup. Um, and it was on rugby on my doorstep was basically my, life, my life's ambition. I've been a bit devoted Western Province fan since I can remember. I, earned th- I owned 30 season tickets at the peak. I sublet that to my friends with a long, long plan of one day consolidating it in one block when we move across to the stadium so, I, so my friends and I and my family can watch rugby together till we grow old. And I think that dream has become a reality and, and then some. 
In terms of my professional career, I spent five, seven years in financial services and I've spent the last 15 years building out the LaRue family office. Um, and I'll retain my responsibility on that front. The plan is to build out the teams at the Stormers Rugby and at the family office to make sure that it can accommodate this dual responsibility. The feeling of the Red Deezer Consortium was that it makes sense to have a shared representative as CEO while the company remains loss-making and essentially spending shareholder money. Um, so once the company achieves break-even, which we have firm intentions of achieving in the next couple of years, and it takes back control of its own financial destiny, the shareholders could well decide to reevaluate this, this arrangement. I mean, the, the, the process Dobbo speaks of concluded three weeks ago. My appointment as CEO took place a week after that, so I've been in the role for two weeks. Um, so clearly brand new to the job. It'll take some time to, 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 to formalise the details of the strategy and to start implementing. But there's a couple of points I wanted to take on, to, just to touch on today. Firstly, I mean, the rugby company is, is different from other businesses I've been involved in, in in two main areas. The first one is we operate in an environment where a big part of our revenue is a large part of our turnover, you know, with the, specifically the URC and the EPCR revenue flowing back to SARU rather than to us. And this creates financial uncertainty when we're looking for stability. Now, I look forward to continued engagement with SARU along with the other international franchises to debate the financial model that allows us to field competitive sites in Europe without the, the owners having to fund continued losses. Then secondly, I think sport is about winning on the field, essentially, um, and that can be very elusive. Even with all the best players, coaches, support staff, you can, st you can still have a team that simply doesn't click for unknown reasons. My experience in business is that the cause and effect of, of management decisions are better understood than on the sports field. Um, and without consistent winning, everything else becomes a very hard sell. And for this reason, the first, uh, the first act of the new board constituted after the Red Diesel investment was to promote Mr. John Dobson, the director of rugby. Um, this was done in recognition of what was, a, was achieved on the field over the last few years and to give him responsibility for a complete rugby program, um, which we can discuss a bit later if you want to, if you have questions on that. Our board member, Mick Dawson, who was formerly the CEO of Leinster, often says that the most important person in this organisation is the man sitting next to me and not the CEO. And I think the promotion to director of rugby <laughs> underlines this. Darby and his coaching team have built our squad into a force to be reckoned with, as we saw all of us with a heartbreak saw on the weekend. But that will make our job on the commercial side so much easier. Winning is the hardest thing, I think. Oh, I Secondly, I can announce today that the board and the shareholders have approved the decision to change the company's registered name from Western Province Professional Rugby, PTY Limited, or WPPR, as it was referred to, simply to Stormers Rugby, PTY Limited. The reasons for this is twofold. It's to closely align our company's corporate profile with that of our top team, the Stormers, from which we derive almost all our revenue. And then also we think it's a it allows for easy differentiation between the professional rugby entity, which, will, which going forward will be known as Stormers Rugby, um, and, that, and the entity responsible for amateur rugby, which is Western Province Rugby Football Union, WPRFU, as it's generally referred to. We found the similarity in names leads to confusion just around the identity of the, of the entities, but it's also their roles in rugby. And we believe the simple name change will at least take the first step towards um, helping both the professional and the community entity to establish its own unique entity, which we think is for the benefit of both. This, no this company name change will not affect the name of any of the teams that compete on the field. So the Western Province team will compete, con continue to compete in the Curry Cup and age group competitions. Then, my ambition for the, for the Stormers Rugby is unsurprisingly very closely aligned to that of probably every fan. It's to simply to build a team that's consistently successful and regularly competing and winning major trophies. The simple terms, in simple terms, this means building a team with enough quality and depth to compete um, in the URC and Investec Champions Cup at the same time. It's easier said than done, as we found out over the weekend. <laughs> and, and I don't think there are too many clubs with different ambitions. I think this is a very generic ambition. But I think there are a couple of things in my Cape Town, and, and the storm is different, that it gives us a real opportunity of doing this. I think we live in a, we all know that we operate in a world-class city, and I think this, uh, it's got international appeal for players, coaches, support staff, 
traveling fans, sponsors. Um, and we play a world-class stadium, which not every club can boast. I think the number of fans we attract to the Stormers matches and those watching us on TV are league leading most Saturdays. It creates a fantastic atmosphere for collaboration with our sponsors and our partners and our fans. And I must, I must commend the, the, the Stormers, the staff, the current staff, for achieving these crowds with a great match they experience, you know, despite very, very difficult circumstances. You know, the, the owner's been in, you know, in administration for the last number of years, and, and we still manage to put on a fantastic show every Saturday. Then I think something we all know, very, know a lot about is the rugby environment in this region is unrivaled across the world in terms of sheer volume of, and of diverse talent that comes through the school system, the university system, the club system. Um, and we want to retain that community club feeling. And then lastly, I think the attractive and exciting brand of rugby we play um, and that the Stormers have become known for has enhanced the Stormers brand over the last 25 years. Wherever the Stormers play, the crowds are bigger. Um, and business takes note of this. And this is something we have to, we have to monetize better. So despite these differentiating factors, consistent on-field success can only be achieved, consist, consistent on-field success can only be achieved with financial stability off the field. And I think that's what Dob, what Dob and his team achieved over the last three seasons is, is uh, so widely admired. To achieve what you've did without the financial stability, I think is amazing, but I don't think it's sustainable. So to deliver on this long-term ambition, we will fo I will focus on the following. Firstly, to manage the Stormers rugby responsibly and bring financial stability to the company. Then drive towards break even over the next three years with the capital invested by the Red Diesel Consortium. Secondly, to continue to prioritize the development and retention of local talent over recruiting established stars from elsewhere. This entails strengthening, strengthening the communication channels with our feeder system, you know, the schools, universities and clubs, as well as the possible establishment of the Stormers Rugby Academy. Thirdly, to provide the director of rugby with a steadily growing rugby budget sufficient for him to retain the bulk of his current squad, to increase cohesion, and to selectively, selectively recruit where there's a specific requirement or opportunity, like we had with Stephen Kitzhoff. And I think we're all delighted to have security services to see him back in, back in Cape Town soon. And then lastly, to build an organization that obsesses over the fans, the need and wants of our fans. I think the move from Newlands to Cape Town Stadium, along with COVID, really hurt our historically successful season ticket and hospitality programs. But it also invited a whole new, a whole new dimension of fans to our stadium because of the whole friendly, the family-friendly nature of this stadium and this environment. So what we need to do is to embrace the challenge and develop new products and experiences to lure back the old Newlands faithful while building out on our new diverse fan base. Because with a winning team and a committed and growing fan base, the development of a sustainable business model is achievable. And with stability, both financially and in the boardroom, we believe we can create a compelling case for local business to get behind the team like in the past. Whether this is as sponsor, as corporate suite holder, season ticket holder, or just as a day fan, you know, it doesn't matter. But we will need the support of local business if we want to build a world-class team, uh, which all of our fans can be proud of. So I really, I really look forward to helping the Stormers take its rightful seat at the high table of World Club Rugby, and I hope we can assist each other along the way. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, so very interesting there. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch that. Uh, I think that's about it for us this weekend. There's a lot of rugby going on. Liam's still a bit jet-lagged, and we can understand that. Uh, no, no, I'm actually not jet-lagged. Uh, I had two, let's just say, I had two very good flights. Um Oh, okay. <laughs> to Hong Kong and back. So, um, yeah, it, it's probably the first time I got eight hours sleep on a flight. So, Jeez, so okay. yeah, well, I'm, then I'm, I'm feeling well. Yes. I'll stop feeling sorry for you then. Uh, no, no, there's no need for you to feel sorry for me. I didn't, I didn't beg for uh, okay, <laughs> sorry okay. <for> either. <laughs> I was just naturally <laughs> feeling sorry. Empathy is a good thing, I suppose. Uh, anyway, but that's it. It's a huge European weekend. Catch us again next week when we talk about all the results and the fallout from those results. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot, a lot to talk about. Cheers. Chat to you then. Thanks for listening. And a reminder, you can find all the To The Last Drop podcasts on the Brendan Nell YouTube channel, iono.fm, Spotify, player.fm, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, and iTunes, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts.